concentrate on this area here. So I want you to start, let's click on info. You're going to spend some time here to make sure that all this information is correct. Obviously your name, what type of business you are, address, your hours, your phone number, your website. If you are a restaurant, obviously put in a link to your uh, menu. If you have a, uh, if your restaurant uh, does reservations obviously add that in here as well and then you can have a whole area that you can check off so many different things about your business and they list everything right here a little description about your business and so forth let's go further posts let me go back up to posts so I only put one in here because we don't use their website and I want this clearly visible to anybody who goes to the site you may have uh, many many rows and rows of different posts that you want to put up here I just want to have this one it's a new ownership and if you click this you get taken directly to the new 304 diner website I think that's important at some point when you've been around a little while you want to uh, check out some of the insights total searches to your page um, customer views total actions they took uh, direction requests phone calls customer visits to your storefront, popular times at your restaurant. Take a look at some of these. Some of these may be important. Some of them, they might give you some good insight.
Okay, so this is the bonus two-step letter um, that I wanted you guys to see. And I think you'll be quite surprised and real happy with uh, what this can do for you. So let's get started. Combined with the power of social media, the following letters have the capacity to produce results far beyond your imagination. And listen to me. If anyone tells you that direct mail is dead and old, I would fire them. We just ran a promotion sending out 10,000 postcards combined with Facebook retargeting and ended up with over $149,000 in sales for our company. And more on this in the course in a different section. Okay? Use my letters here as a guide, but customize yours for your own business. For this to work, you must follow what I outline here. Don't skimp on the delivery, on the delivery technique or this will not work. The delivery and the actual letters work hand in hand in this two-step sequence. And I really want you to let us know how this helped you get through to your biggest potential client or how it helped you land the job interview of your dreams. The purpose of these letters is to immediately grab attention of your prospect and to build some anticipation unlike any other letter they have ever received. These letters will pave the way to an easier phone call to your prospective client as well. Instead of a guarded tone, listen, you guys know what it's like calling people, right? Instead of a guarded tone when calling a new prospect, we have found that people who received this letter, or these letters rather, more accurately, are more at ease when you call because you were creative and you did something they will never forget. It's a welcome relief and break through, and it'll, it'll break through all the clutter of the hundreds of emails and texts your prospect receives each and every day. This exact letter you're, re you're viewing today got me into some huge companies because it differentiated me from all the other people trying to get their business. I ended up getting into and doing business with Seagram's, Shiseido Cosmetics, Boehringer Engel Engelheim Pharmaceuticals, to name a few, and ended up with huge commissions on sales we made. Are you guys ready to see the letters and the mailing process? All right, here we go. So this is what I want you guys to do. Go to FedEx today and get a bunch of FedEx envelopes and forms for mailing. Next, go to the post office and get a bunch of priority mail envelopes. Just get the regular ones, don't get the flat rate. Those are too expensive. Do this next. Well, here's the actual process of what, uh, what you're gonna be doing. You're going to deliver to your prospective client on Monday a FedEx envelope along with letter number one, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, with a real stock certificate attached to it. Not a copy of a stock certificate, a real genuine canceled one that you purchased online. You can get these on eBay, right, for as little as 99 cents each. Why FedEx? You tell me, right? A FedEx on Beside that, there is an important thing that a lot of people, a lot of young people who start the business forget it, they miss it, is to know who your customer is. Who is your targeted customer, okay? Who is the people who are going to use your product, okay? What kind of problems are you going to solve with your product? You, mu you must know all this stuff, which right now in a minute we are going to talk about it. So the very first step here, as you can see, it is to know, to find out who is your target audience, right? everything about them, who they are, where they live, what they do, what they like, what they, what they hate, this kind of stuff, okay? We'll get to that. The second step is where you know about your customers, when you know about your target audience, you will also understand where they will go to fix their problem, okay? They have a problem, they want to solve it. Where do, you, uh, where do they go to find the answer and what you have to do you should be ready there right so the next step on digital marketing is to use different platforms 
to appear yourself, to appear your business, to show your product to people that, hey, for example, here, my product is my digital marketing course, right? You as a target audience, you wanted to learn digital marketing, right? So you went online, you went into Google, you went into, for example, Instagram, Facebook, Udemy, and So in this part, we are going to learn how we can get our domain and our host in the cheapest way possible. Now, uh, I have searched a lot to find a company, a website that provide this. And also, they have a good speed and everything work fine and easy on their platform. So I found this website here. As you can see, the name um, is the address of this website is namecheap.com. Right. So right now you can pause the video and uh, search for this website. Come here to their website. And then uh, when you are here, come on domains and click on domain name search. Right. Let So welcome to the next part on creating our sign up forms on our website. So in the previous lecture, we created our sign up forms, our pop up form and our embedded form. Uh, right now, what we are going to do, we are going to import these forms into our website. So I'm going to come back here. This is the uh, sign up forms page. And the second one, it is written embedded forms. So I'm going to open it. So welcome to the next part on creating our sign up forms on our website. So in the previous lecture, we created our sign up forms. Our So why use stories and metaphors in therapy? Well, there are many reasons that stories and metaphors can be helpful for therapy. One of them is to lay down and update neurological patterns. So the brain works essentially like a pattern matching machine. And so if you want to lay down or update those patterns, one way to do it is through stories or metaphors. You can allow 
problems to be seen from an observing self position. So we'll talk about the observing self in a future lecture. But what you're doing is letting someone see their problem from an objective position where they're not absorbed in the story, they're not absorbed in the feelings and emotions of that story. You can use stories and metaphors to stimulate neurological patterns. So rather than that doesn't really engage all the senses, whereas you can tell an engaging story, bringing in visual, they suddenly lock on to you. If you say to somebody, you'll never guess what metaphorical kind of way, and then to explain what they mean, ideas across to the client. Without, so resistance often happens when you're telling someone to do something. So, briefly, what would you like to achieve? Um, I'd like to be successful in running a business which involves various therapies um, and manifest that sort of creation of it. But I have a blockage because I feel guilty about earning money from helping people because I have a Buddhist background. So I have a real dilemma with this and I um, send myself in tangents, you know, that I'm not doing things ethically or morally, but at the same time in the West, sometimes people only value something by paying for it. So it's a mixture of, an e of Eastern ethics and living in the West and I find it difficult to reconcile the two. So I end up at an impasse mm. where I can't go forward and yet I'd, I've learned some amazing therapies. The first principle of influence that I want to talk about in this course is reciprocity. Maybe you've had the experience where someone gives you a gift unexpectedly. What do you do? Uh, well, you turn around and figure out a way to pay them back somehow. You rush out to the store and get them a gift, or you go to your basement and dig up something that was a gift from a long time ago, and you think, oh, this will do, because you just feel as though you're there's this pressure to return the favor. Similarly, you've probably heard the phrase, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. That general idea that we like to reciprocate things that are done for us. And this is the social rule that applies to this principle. In general, we learn that if someone does you a favor, you pay them back. That's a norm that we live by. And so how can we use this social rule and use it in a way that maximizes influence? Well, we can apply this principle of reciprocity. You can gain compliance by first giving something yourself. 
by giving something, either something concrete and something you can hold, or an idea or an offer, any kind of way in which you can show that you're going out of your way to do something for another person, implicitly puts in their mind that it's their job then to return the favor. One of my favorite studies in reciprocity and in social influence in general is this Christmas card study, because it's so simple. All that they did was they sent out Christmas cards to a bunch of strangers one year. They just got names from a phone book, sent out a whole bunch of Christmas cards, and to complete strangers. And what do you do if you get a Christmas card from someone you don't know? You put them on your list for next year. And that's exactly what they found. The next year, these researchers received a whole bunch of Christmas cards from total strangers. But they were the strangers that they sent Christmas cards to just one year before. So again, this just highlights the fact that there's an implicit rule that when someone does something for you, you are compelled and expected to return that favor, to reciprocate what that person did. And we can see this at least in some way in this Christmas card study. A more famous study in reciprocity is this Coca-Cola study, and it really is a great way of demonstrating how this works. What they did in this study is they had Two people, presumably, participating in a study, a general psychology study, where they were doing some kind of activity. And in reality, only one of the people in the study was an actual participant. The other person was a confederate, working with the experimenters. So really, there's one person in this study who believes that this is a two-person study, and both of them are participants in it. And when there's an intermission in the middle of the experiment the confederate leaves the room, presumably to go to the bathroom or something. When the confederate comes back, in some cases, he's holding two bottles of Coca-Cola. And he says to the participant, hey, you know, I passed by a vending machine. I thought I'd grab you a Coke. Here you go. That's all. But importantly, it was a gift. It was something that this person gave to the other participant in the study, and then they continued on with the rest of the study. But at the end, when they were packing up their things and getting ready to leave, the Confederate goes, you know, actually, I am uh, I'm part of this organization, and we're doing a raffle. We're selling raffle tickets for just a dollar each. Would you, uh, would you mind buying a raffle ticket? And so what... In this lecture, I'm going to go through the basic tools that you'll need to teach English online successfully. The great thing is that you might find that you've already got everything you need to get started. And you certainly have the first and most important of those tools, which is you, the teacher. Never forget this. You are the language model for your student. You are the communicative partner for your student. You're the one who gives feedback to your student. You're the one who crafts the lessons so that your student has opportunities to learn new language and to use it. So everything else in this lecture, and in fact all the ideas in this course, are simply there to support you. Secondly, you need a device that lets you communicate with your student. 
Now, this doesn't just need to be a desktop computer or a laptop. It could be a tablet computer or even a smartphone. In fact, a standard phone or smartphone might be enough. I know English teachers who just use their phone to carry out lessons. For example, a woman in Bangkok, I know, who phones up her student a couple of times a week while he's travelling home from work on the bus. And if all you plan to do is offer conversational practice with people locally, then a phone is really all you need. And if you want to do the same with anyone in the world, then all you really need is a smartphone with an internet connection. I personally used to use a desktop computer Hello everyone and welcome to the Artificial Intelligence and Computer Vision for Self-Driving Cars course. First, I would like to thank you all for enrolling in this course. I hope you will find the course useful and informative. The first two questions we need to answer are, what are self-driving cars and why do we need them? Let's start with the first question, what are self-driving cars? Well, self-driving cars are capable of moving from one point to another without human interaction. These advanced vehicles are capable of Hello everyone and welcome to this section. In this section, we're going to learn how to do image transformations. So we're going to learn how to do rotation, translation. We're going to learn how to do um, a lot of other processes, but it's very simple. So a fine transformation mainly preserves par uh, parallel lines in simple, to in simple form. So parallel lines for the original image and for the transformed image are preserved. So as you guys can see here, these be doing is what we call a translation and that's how you actually translate the image or just move it you know in a kind of a linear uh, format to hello everyone and welcome to the section in this section which is kind of the canny um, edge detection on the image all right Okay, so here we run it and then let's show the actual image. So that's it, that's my image. Again, that's image after we obtain the edge detection. Again, it's showing kind of the lines and that's the first step, all right? Okay, great, let's exit that part. And then the next step is I'm gonna apply cv2.half lines, okay? And then I'm gonna give it the argument gonna be my image canny. And then here I'm gonna define the resolution. So here I'm defining the resolu resolution of row parameter. Here I'm defining the resolution of the angle, which is again, um, here I'm defining pi divided by 180, which is one degrees, pretty much. And then here, 
I'm going to define um, uh, simply the threshold, which is kind of the voting. What's the minimum number of uh, votes that I need to include in order to actually detect a line? All right, let's run it. And that's pretty much it. In lines in here, we're going to return simply all the values, which is rho and theta for all the, all the lines that has been detected. All right, so what do you mean by these numbers? Okay, so first of all, 